Uh, well, welcome back. Hopefully you had a good break. Um, let's talk a little bit more about burnout. I know Rin talked about it uh, a bunch yesterday, um, but I will also be talking about a few things because I think that it is, there are community solutions um, involved here. It's, it's not just a, a DevOps thing. I think it's a, a responsibility that we each have to take on. Uh, but in order to do that, I actually wanted to introduce, uh, not myself, I want to introduce my friend Bob. Uh, Bob is not his real name. Uh, I've, I've changed his name. I've changed a lot of the details of the stories, little bits, in order to help protect his privacy. But I did ask him if I could share our story and this experience um, because it, it really fundamentally changed my life. Um, he said yes, so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to share it. Uh, but Bob and I worked together uh, many years ago. We worked at the, the same company. Um, I was mostly dev. He was mostly ops. Um, and I loved working with Bob. And the things that I liked about Bob is that he's, he's genuine and honest. Um, he's enthusiastically curious. Um, and he's an optimistically hard worker. And these are, these are a great combo for somebody that you work with. This is, I think everybody looks for this type of coworker. Um, when I say he's genu genuine and honest, he's the type of guy where you, know, you see him in the morning, he says, hey, how's it going? Um, that's not just a euphemism for how, like, you know, hello or good morning. He actually is like, how's it going? Like, tell me about your life. Tell me about like, what you did last night. Uh, you know, wants to deepen that, that relationship. Uh, when I say that he's enthusiastically curious, uh, Bob was always the guy that whatever that like, hot new technology was, he was the first guy to learn it. Um, within the boundaries of he understood, like, I want to learn it because, not because, like, Kubernetes was the hot new thing. Like, he was the first guy to learn Kubernetes, like, way back when it was alpha. And it was like, cool, we're not, never going to roll this out. Uh, but he's like, I, I don't care, right? It's just like, it's the new thing. I always want to learn about that. Eventually, it may get there, um, and it did, but uh, he was that guy, right? And so you always want that guy around when you're working because, you know, you can pick up stuff off of them. You can learn from them. Um, and it's fun to see their excitement. And then being an optimistically hard worker combined with that, Bob always had this, this notion that together as a team, we were all smart people. We could just pull together whatever problem that we had, um, whether that was outages or, you know, building a better product. Um, we could do that together, right? You just put our brains together. We're smart enough people. We can figure it out. Which made you always want to come to work, right? No matter what challenge you had. So it was really fantastic working with Bob. Uh, Bob and I ended up moving and going our separate ways um, after some time. And Bob ended up at a company that I, I like to describe as this meme. Um, they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, from my outside perspective, it's like, hey, what's your company do, Bob? And he like, give me this weird answer and like, they don't know what they're doing. Like one moment they were like supposed to be this uh, company that was making these products, and they just had a regular online store. And then they did this pivot, and they were like, "We want to be the Netflix of our industry, right?" You you know that's a problem when you know your company describes itself as another company. Um, and then they they pivoted again, and they were like, "No, we don't want to sell to end users. We want to sell to like enterprises." And they became this like enterprisey thing. Uh, and from his internal perspective, it was just they were chasing all the buzzwords, right? So they would have Bob work on a, a task, and then Bob would get that done, only to find out that like, that wasn't the goal anymore. So like, one, one time, he was telling me about this great project he did. Um, he got really into web performance, and so he sped up their online checkout process um, and shaved you know, like seconds off of each page load time. Uh, ended up that like he tracked that back and he increased their sales by like two million dollars that year, um, which is amazing. But he didn't get any recognition for that because suddenly they were like, we're not selling to end users. We're now this like subscription model thing, um, so it doesn't really matter, which is really demoralizing, right? When you you work really hard to do all this stuff. Uh, it got really bad because when when Bob was doing all this work. Uh, management suddenly, you know, they're like, oh, you worked on this web performance thing. That's not what we wanted. Um, so they were like, well, you're a remote worker. I think we need to move you into the office. Uh, we're not ending remote work. Uh, it's just you. You seem to be off the reservation. We're going to move you to Silicon Valley um, to be in the office so we can manage you a bit better, um, which was horrible because it was, I'm 
blatantly unfair, right? It's just singling out one person, but Bob was like involved in a, a garage band. He had some friends, um, so he used to play a bunch of music. He was on the, uh, the city rec league for softball. Um, he had all this, these things, and they moved him to the Bay Area. They didn't give him a, a cost of living increase, so now he's making less. He has no friends. He's working all the time. Um, it was pretty bad. It got so bad, in fact, that um, Bob one day tweeted out about this thing that he called the cap theorem of life. Is everyone familiar with the cap theorem? Um, the cap theorem in distributed systems says uh, a CAP, cons consistency, availability, or partition tolerance. You can only choose two in a distributed system. And so Bob had this cap theorem for life that said um, you could either have uh, physical health, uh, family health, or um, uh, work success, and you could only pick two, right? Or in Bob's case, you could only pick one. Uh, and I, I read that tweet and I was like, that's really fucked up, right? Like, you shouldn't have to give up your family or be sick or just fail at your job. Like, you should be able to do all of these things. Um, there's no reason why you have to just pick one. So I ended up giving him a, him a call and I, I quickly realized that on this call, uh, Bob was really high on some drugs. Um, he was in a very, very bad place. Um, and I realized I wasn't equipped for this, right? Like, what happens when you show up at work or you have a colleague or a friend and you realize they burnt out to the point that they're fucked up and you don't know what to do, right? Do I hang up and call the cops and be like, hey, this is Bob's address, go check on him? Like, what happens in that time when I hang up, right? Or do I put him on hold or what do you do, right? Do you even call the cops? I mean, these days, Unfortunately, a lot of cops aren't trained for mental health stuff, so they show up and they're thinking some crime's going on and your friend gets shot, right? So, totally ill-equipped. Um, what am I equipped for? So, I am Jason, I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog. Help people with technical problems, often around monitoring. Um, aside from that, though, I, I like to fly around. I'm a crazy person that likes flying, so I do mileage runs and crazy things like that. I also like whiskey and I play a ton of Pokemon Go, as Matt and Aaron up here know. Um, if you see me wandering around town, I'm not lost. I wandered around for an hour and a half last night because there's a Pokemon Halloween event. Uh, if you do play, that's my friend code. Um, also, note about the whiskey, if you are being burnt out, um, if you are in a bad situation in work, uh, don't self-medicate. It's, it's not the, the proper response. Um, but if you do like enjoying a, a good glass every now and then, uh, talk to me later because I'm always looking for, for new, interesting whiskeys. Uh, a little bit about Datadog, just because they do pay my salary. Uh, it is a SaaS-based monitoring platform. We are sponsoring. There's a table upstairs, so you can learn more about the product. Um, we operate at huge scale, trillions of points of data every day. We're moving everything, or almost everything's already moved into Kubernetes. Um, so we're doing really interesting stuff. If you are in a bad environment and you're looking for new opportunities, we are hiring. So again. We're upstairs, drop by the table, uh, happy to talk. So I, I have said that this is a community problem um, with burnout, right? Some people are like, why do we keep talking about all this burnout stuff? Like someone, if you hate your job, just quit and like go do something else. Um, and that's not really a solution. But if you are wondering, is this actually a problem? Well, Matt mentioned before about the number of pages that people get at night. Uh, there's a company called GFI that did a study a couple years ago. They did a, a survey, and they found that 40% of IT people regularly lose sleep um, due to stress. This isn't being on call. This isn't that three quarters of a million calls that wake you up at night. This is simply that we're stressed out and we're losing sleep because of it. They found that 50% of us uh, work between 8 to 20 hours of overtime every week. Now, this wasn't defined as how many hours over 40 do you work? This is simply, you define it. And I know that most of us not only work 40, many of us work 45, sometimes 50, and we consider that normal. Um, so when we're talking about overtime, if you're like, if you're one of those people who consider 45 normal, well, you're probably doing 53 then, right? Um, according to the stat. And this is the worst stat, I think, is that 82% of us have considered leaving tech because of the stress. Um, 
that's, that's a huge number, right? If we're, if we're thinking that burnout isn't an issue, but most of us have considered leaving this and doing something else, that's a problem, right? I started a, a Twitter uh, thread a while back just of the, like, when I retire from tech, and it was interesting because I got a ton of responses of what people would do. Uh, mine was to move to Hawaii and start making uh, soy sauce out of ocean water because I thought that would be, like, <laughs> cool and interesting. So if, if we are talking about is this a community problem, then it definitely is. Um, so like I said, there, I think this is a community problem, which means that it's going to require us as a DevOps community to fix it. So what are some of the solutions? Well, number one is DevOps, right? I should point out Rin's talk. Uh, their talk from yesterday was fantastic. Uh, I will probably replace that once it gets posted online. Uh, the other one that I think is fantastic is John Willis. John Willis was one of the original founders of DevOps Days. Uh, he helped run the first DevOps Days in the US. Um, and he had a fantastic talk, so that's the link to his. I won't go over it too much. I won't reiterate everything that Rin said yesterday. The other, though, is self-care. It's, it's starting to take care of ourselves, right? We can cut down on the amount of burnout just by taking care of ourselves. Ken Mugridge, who's also on the DevOps Days uh, global team, helps run the DevOps Days in Seattle, gave a fantastic talk a couple years ago in Portland about how to take care of yourself. This was mentioned in Rin's talk, and it's mentioned in, in Ken's, but there are six real mismatches that lead to burnout. And the first is obviously work overload. If I think of my friend Bob, he was working a ton of overtime because he was constantly pivoting what he was working on. I think all of us are familiar with having that work overload. The other way, though, is a lack of control. And with Bob, it was obvious, right? He, he never got to say what he was working on. It was always he was told what was to work on, and then he was told to shift. Um, having a lack of control really makes you feel helpless in what you're doing. Uh, so one way that we can help fix this as a community is to ensure that everybody has a voice. When you're in meetings, if you notice a co coworker or a colleague that isn't getting a say, or people are just talking over them. This particularly, unfortunately, happens uh, if you have colleagues that are women or uh, people of color. There are a lot of times that they just get overlooked or their ideas are sort of taken. So be that helpful person and, and help amplify their voice. Insufficient rewards. Uh, like I said, Bob got moved to Silicon Valley, which, as we all know, is like one of the most expensive places to live. Uh, so there's, there's obviously like pay stuff involved here. But as a community, I think rewards, you don't have to pay people more if that's not, you know, if you're not a manager. But just recognize them, right? Those rewards can simply be acknowledgement. Next time you have a coworker that does something, you know, tell them good job. Breakdown of workplace or project. I, I mentioned project because I know a lot of people work on open source. Um, but a, a breakdown of community, feeling disconnected. Um, this is really obvious. You know, if you don't feel connected to your coworkers, when Bob got moved to Silicon Valley, he literally knew nobody in the office because he was remote. And the rest of his team was remote. It was just him being moved to the office. Hang out with your coworkers. It's not that hard. I know a lot of people, they go to work and they're like, cool, I've done my job. Now they jet home after work. They try to beat that rush hour, get back to their families. But take some time, once a week, once every other week. Go out to happy hour with your coworkers. Just hang out. Um, it really is as easy as building those bridges. The next one is an absence of fairness. And obviously, again, with Bob, it was completely unfair. He was a remote worker. They had a bunch of remote workers. He was the only one that was forced to come into the office. Um, but again, speak up. If you see injustice, if you see people being treated unfairly, uh, speak up, right? And then the last is, is values conflict. And you know, this doesn't have to be huge. Um, I always give the example, you know, if you believe in gun control, don't go work for the NRA. Um, but it could be small things. Those values could be things like Bob valued web performance, right? He worked on that. He did a fantastic job. And apparently, that was not a value for the company at the time. So keep those values in line. Um, Rin also mentioned this. Google did have a study. And they, they were talking about what makes a successful team. And 
the hypothesis was that, that it was cross-functional teams, that you have a team of everybody that has just that right skill. So you have one developer, one QA person, one ops person, one PM. Um, you have all these skills in alignment, and you should be able to get everything done. Uh, and what they found was that that wasn't the case. Um, psychological safety has been mentioned in a few talks already. Uh, but the other ones are things like dependability and structure and clarity around your job and having meaning, being able to make an impact. And all of these are actually sort of aligned with those mismatches, right? They set up the perfect environment not only for people to feel excited and energized about what they're doing, but also to prevent burnout. So those are some of the, the ideas. You know, we can implement DevOps, but unfortunately not every company will, and we can take care of ourselves. Uh, but I like to point out that we need to really equip ourselves to be able to help others, right? Because if there's a person on your team that's getting burnt out and your team is 10 people, well, that means that 10 people are affected even though only one person's burnt out. The effect of burnout is far more than just ourselves. Uh, the stat right now is that a third of all Americans uh, will know somebody or face burnout themselves. So if you think of that, like, that's a lot of us. So the first thing that we have to do is be able to recognize burnout. What does it actually look like? And it's been mentioned before that uh, the, the Maslach burnout inventory, which is you, you look for people that are exhausted, that are cynical, um, and that are feeling a loss of efficacy. They're, they're less efficient. They feel like they're not accomplishing a lot in their, in their work. Uh, and I think that this is, it's a good way to, to tell, but it, I particularly like, there's a different one called the SMBM, which actually helps define this a little bit better. They, they mentioned physical fatigue, which is similar. You can always tell when someone's tired. Uh, but they mentioned emotional exhaustion, because cynicism, we often think as, of people as getting very pessimistic, as like very negative. But oftentimes I feel like, you know, for me personally, I don't so much get negative as I just stop giving a fuck, right? Like, emotional exhaustion is that. It's just, a lot of us just become apathetic in our jobs. You show up, when I've been burnt out, show up, sit in front of a computer, don't do anything, don't care. Um, and the other is cognitive weariness, right? Again, you, it's hard to tell if somebody feels like they're less efficient or less productive unless they tell us. But it's really easy when we interact with our colleagues, especially if we're connected with them, uh, to, to see if they, they have this cognitive weariness. You ask them a question, and it should be a simple answer, and it takes them a while to, to actually come up with that answer. Or you ask them a question and they simply don't know the answer, but you know that they should know it. But in all honesty, really, the, the solution to this is you don't need some sort of scientific definition to help you define or recognize burnout. It's simply to be connected. It's, it's to know. Um, and the, the way that I like to do this is that um, I have a friend, Frank, who has a rule that he calls 3 a.m. friends. 3 a.m. friends says that you should be able to name three friends that you can call at 3 in the morning to bail you out of a jam. And if you can, then you're connected. And sim similarly, you should have three friends who should feel totally comfortable calling you at 3 a.m. to bail them out. Um, and that's, that's connected. And it's not saying that we need to set up pager duty for friendship. Like, put all your friends on pager duty and, like, you know, something's wrong, hit the button. But, you know, I think we've all been there, right? You're in a tough spot, who do you call? You should have someone to call, and if you don't, start thinking about that. Who, what relationships can you work on? Um, so when I say you'll know, um, you could be wrong. That's okay. Um, in fact, you could be wrong, and it might not be burnout. It could be depression. Uh, one of the interesting things is that it doesn't really matter, um, because I'll go through some steps later, the response is going to be the same. Interesting thing about depression, though, is they did a study, and they took all of these people that were burnt out. Um, I think the study was particularly around teachers. But they took a, a group of people that were burnt out, and they ran them through um, the, the diagnosis to see if they had depression. Surprisingly, 86% met the, the clinical criteria for being depressed. Um, but that's OK. Like I said, the result is still the same, like what we want to do. So the way that we can get equipped, I particularly love, and I want everyone to try to do this, is take mental health first aid. How many people here have taken like physical first aid, like Red Cross? Do you know how to do CPR? Awesome. 
If you don't, um, you should also do that. That's fantastic. But those of you who've done training, how many of you are doctors, EMTs? Got one up here in the front. But most of the people that raised your hands, you're not, right? Because the whole point of, of first aid isn't the idea that, like, cool, I learned how to do CPR. Now I'm going to go drive an ambulance all day, right? It's the idea that, like, we understand we're all out there in the world. We're, we're at our jobs. We're going out to eat at restaurants. We're at home. And you're around, and you know these things because you know that at some point, someone might have a problem. They might be choking. They, they might, you know, be in a pool and get knocked unconscious and need, like, mouth to mouth. And it's these things that we can do. And we're, we're there just to step in. And we learn in, in first aid training, what's the first thing you do? Well, you, you respond and you yell, someone call 911, or you call 911. Right? You, you get those professionals in action. But you're there to help just until they come. And that's what mental health first aid really is. It's that you might be in a situation where there's a crisis. You should have some skills to be able to help step in um, until professionals can get involved. One of the fantastic things about Philadelphia that I didn't know until I was uh, researching this talk, you guys get mental health first aid for free. They run it like a few times every month, and it's completely free. You don't under, it's amazing because other places in the country, it can be up to like 500 bucks. Um, and this is a, a one-day course, or you can do it over a few evenings. Um, so it's amazing. You have this fantastic resource. And the city of Philadelphia has committed to having, um, I believe the number is 30,000 people uh, mental health first aid trained by the end of the year. Um, so you can be a part of that. So that's the, the link at the bottom is actually uh, the link to, uh, they, they just run it on Eventbrite. Again, completely free, so you can sign up there. Or if you're somewhere else in the country or you're, you're thinking of sharing the information, mentalhealthfirstaid.org is where you can get that info. So I know as much as I really want all of you to do that, because it's free, it happens all the time, not all of you will. For those who don't, um, or just to give you a, a nice quick head start, what you'll learn in the, in the course is algae. Algae is this koala. It's a koala because the program originated in Australia. And as we know, when things are in Australia, it's either koalas or kangaroos. So they did the koala. Uh, but the A, unfortunately, also algae is not a tech acronym, otherwise A would be for algae because we love that self-referential acronym thing. Uh, but A is to assess for risk of suicide or harm, right? You, just like triaging a, a technical incident, you go in there and the first thing you have to do is identify what's the severity, right? What are we looking at? And so for people, it's are you going to hurt yourself or others? And you know, how do you do that? The first thing you have to do is just you ask. I know it's, it's scary. And actually, I had a friend that came up to me later. He's like, I saw your talk, and I don't know. That's, that's a scary thing. Should we actually be doing that? And the, the answer is yes. You don't know unless you ask. So simply put, hey, friend, you're in a bad place. Uh, you're thinking of hurting yourself. Like, has that come up? Um, yeah, that's scary. But the great thing is, like, you know, some people are like, if I, if I ask that, isn't that going to plant that in their head? They're going to start thinking about it now. And the answer is no. Like, that's a complete myth. You're never going to plant the idea in somebody's head that they should commit suicide or that they should con consider it. Um, and it really is there, just like triaging, again, like a technical incident. It's, it's there to gauge, start getting a feel. Now, you obviously don't lead it, leave it there. You know, if they, if they say yes and you need help, well, there's the Philadelphia Crisis Center that you can call. There's a bunch of numbers in the area, but that's the primary one. Or you could just call the national number. There are people there to help, right? So if you're with somebody, you can both pick up the phone, or you can do a three-way call into that if you, if you think you need help. Or you could just continue to listen, right? Keep talking to them. That's really the next step. So the L in algae is listen non-judgmentally. Start to just get them talking, talking through what they're feeling, um, you know, get them conversing about it, putting it into words. Putting things into words really helps people to start to sort through some of their feelings, sort through their ideas. Um, it's the same way when I run postmortems and tell people how to run that. It's, you know, it's starting to converse. People have, if you just start acting a, on an idea, sometimes your ideas aren't completely clear. They're not structured. So communicating those forces you to organize your thoughts. Um, and sometimes that helps. 
the G and algae is to give a reassurance and information. So again, if your friend's like, yeah, I've kind of thought about hurting myself, or even if they haven't, um, reassure them. Burnout is not a personal flaw. Burnout has nothing to do with you as an individual. It has everything to do with the situations that you're in, the environments that you're in. It's not a personal defect, right? The other reassurance is, as mentioned, a lot of us are under stress. Burnout affects one third of Americans. So uh, they're not alone is, is the, the basic thing there. And to give them information, right? Information about how they can help themselves, which leads to the first E in algae. And that's to encourage appropriate professional help. Right? Again, as first aid, you're not there as the long-term uh, care provider or a person that's going to be there. Although if you are a friend, you can help them out in the long term. But you are there to, to step in and just be there until they can get that professional help. So there's a lot of professional help out there. Um, there's a ton, again, in the Philly area. There's DBHIDS, which is uh, a crazy long acronym, which is, again, isn't self-referential, which is sad. But that's uh, the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual, Intellectual Disability Services. Um, but they have a mental health delegate line. This is fantastic. You can actually call them up. Uh, they do mental health crisis units, so they'll actually send people out to you. So if you have a friend that's, or a colleague that's in having a bad problem or having in crisis, you can actually call these people up, and they have people that will drive out, meet with you face to face. Um, they also do short-term in-home help. So if you have a colleague that's, again, in crisis or having a problem, they can actually set up some reoccurring visits to, the, to their home and just meet with them. Uh, there's also 211. 211 is available in over 90% of the country. So no matter where you're at, if you're like me and you're in another state and you're on a call, um, 211, you can call them up no matter where you're at, and they'll find you resources for some other part of the country. Um, or if you're in another part of the country, they'll find you the local resources. OSMI, the Open Sourcing Mental Illness, Illness Project, has a bunch of resources. Also, NAMI Philly. Uh, NAMI is the National Association on Mental Illness. Uh, they have a local chapter that does a bunch of fantastic work as well. The last E in algae is to encourage self-help uh, and other support strategies. So again, starting to think a little bit more long-term. How can we help ourselves, or how can your colleagues help themselves? Burnout.io, another tech-oriented website that helps with burnout. Uh, they have a lot of fantastic resor resources. Mood Gym is a, an interesting one. Mood Gym uses mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, which is a very fancy word, but really is just this idea of being able to cognitively, like being mentally aware of what we're feeling um, and what our bodies are doing, and starting to use that. So Mood Gym is an online tool that actually helps you do that, um, developed in Australia, completely science-based, so it's not just a bunch of weird uh, mental mumbo-jumbo. Uh, and then a good one that was mentioned to me yesterday by Jesus, who's somewhere here, um, and actually Rachel uh, mentioned this as well. There's a book, Search Inside Yourself. It's all actually a program as well um, that has been rolled out in a bunch of tech companies like uh, Google and, and other large companies to help people start to uh, analyze and, again, use some of this mindfulness-based um, cognitive therapy. So just to recap, algae. Um, assess for risk of suicide or harm, listen non-judgmentally, give reassurance and information, uh, encourage appropriate professional help, and then encourage them to help themselves. So back to that call. Um, Bob was, was really messed up. And again, I didn't know what to do, but surprisingly, I'd managed to know most of algae. Um, while, while he was on the phone, I ended up opening up my laptop. I researched the drug he was on. It was not great, but very little harm of him overdosing and hurting himself, very little harm of him actually freaking out and hurting anyone else. So I just kept him on the phone, and we talked. We talked for about two and a half hours um, until it, was, it became more obvious. His speech got a little bit better. I could tell that the drugs were wearing off, um, and, and he was starting to get a, a bit mo more coherent. Uh, ended up, at, at the end, uh, he... He was in a good spot where he was going to drive home, go to bed, 
Um, so, I, so I got off the phone with him, I let him go. Ended up visiting him a couple weeks later, um, and he, he was doing a little bit better. He was still in a bad place. Um, ended up that the company laid him off. Uh, they had finally done so many pivots that they didn't think they needed most of their IT department. Uh, the, so Bob, yeah, the, the layoff was hard. Um, totally different stresses, but being outside of a, a toxic environment was good for him. He ended up spending about a year of just not being employed and trying to figure out what he wanted to do. He was one of that, the 82% that was strongly considering leaving tech and figuring out if he wanted a new career. Uh, I am happy to say that Bob did come back to tech. Um, he's at Google now, um, and he loves his job. He's having a fantastic time getting to work with a lot of cool new technologies, the stuff that he couldn't implement before. But yeah, without managed, knowing algae, I managed to do it. Uh, so just to recap, though, this is going to take all of us as a community to, to fight burnout, to help each other. Um, and the ways that we do that is to spread DevOps. So, the first link there is to the DevOps Days Philly YouTube channel. Um, the videos from yesterday aren't up yet, but hopefully they will be. Um, encourage self-help um, and action, so Ken's talk. And then please go out there, take mental health first aid training. Again, it's free. It happens two or three times every month. Um, so there you go. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. We have a few minutes, sweet. Note that I am not a trained mental health professional. I just took the course, and I'm passionate about it because it changed my life. Um, that said, happy to take any questions. Also, if you have a question but you don't want to ask it in public, feel free to email me or hit me up on Twitter. My DMs are always open. All right, thank you very much, Jason. Thanks.